Okay, good morning, everyone. I'd like us to look again at uh, Ezekiel chapter 7. I'm going to begin reading in verse 16. I'm going to read till the end of the chapter, so 16 down to verse 27. And we're going to think about when wealth is worthless, or if you want a short title, worthless wealth, when wealth is worthless. So beginning uh, in verse 16, he says, but they that escape of them shall escape and shall be on the mountains like doves of the valleys all of them mourning, every one for his iniquity. All hands shall be feeble, all knees shall be weak as water. They shall also gird themselves with sackcloth, and horror shall cover them, and shame shall be upon all faces, and baldness upon all their heads. They shall cast their silver in the streets, and their gold shall be removed, their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of wrath, the wrath of the Lord. They shall not satisfy their souls, neither fill their bowels, because it is the stumbling block of their iniquity. As for the beauty of his ornament, he set it in majesty, but they made the images of their abominations and of their detestable things therein. Therefore have I set it far from them. And I will give it into the hands of the strangers for a prey and to the wicked of the earth for a spoil, and they shall pollute it. My face will I turn also from them, and they shall pollute my secret place, for the robbers shall enter into it and defile it. Make a chain, for the land is full of bloody crimes, and the city is full of violence. Wherefore, I will bring the worst of the heathen, and they shall possess their houses. I will also make the pump of the strong to cease, and their holy places shall be defiled. Destruction cometh, and they shall seek peace, and there shall be none. Mischief shall come upon mischief, and rumor shall be upon rumor. Then shall they seek a vision of the prophet, but the law shall perish from the priest, and counsel from the ancients. The king shall mourn, and the prince shall be clothed with desolation, and the hands of the people of the land shall be troubled. I will do unto them after their way, and according to their deserts will I judge them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. Uh, as we look at this, I just want to kind of review a little bit because we're jumping into the middle of a chapter. But basically, uh, we're in a chapter, uh, along with chapter 6, that deals with oral ministry. Uh, Ezekiel, who normally is dumb, uh, has now had his mouth opened and he's giving messages. He's giving messages following uh, the uh, visual aids that he had used in chapters 4 and 5 uh, to grab their attention. And after these visual aids, now God has opened his mouth and he's giving messages explaining uh, what was going on in those visual aids uh, concerning judgment coming on the house of Judah. So we're in this chapter uh, that is oral ministry. And we mentioned uh, last time that there were certain word pictures that he brings out uh, in this chapter, uh, beginning in verse 10. Uh, where he's dealing with iniquity being at its height. He talked about the budding rod, the budding rod of pride and violence. It had reached its fullness and God had to judge them. So that was the first of the word pictures. And then the business world in verses 12 uh, down to verse uh, 15. And there you had uh, the whole idea of, you know, where people would sell thinking about the year of Jubilee, uh, and, uh, of course, how the, the buyer always feels like he's being cheated. It's all an act. And the one who's uh, uh, selling also feels kind of glum. But then afterwards, they're they're kind of rejoicing because they've, they've made a good deal. But all of this uh, is not going to happen because there won't be a year of jubilee for them to go back to their houses. And so the business world affected. And then the watchman on the walls we saw, again, in verse um, 14, and now uh, we're in the fourth of these word pictures, and it's concerning verse 16. Uh, it talks about these morning doves um, on the mountains. And so we'll just read verse 16. It says, but they that escape of them 
shall escape and shall be on the mountains like doves of the valleys, all of them mourning, everyone for his iniquity. All hands shall be feeble, all knees shall be weak as water. So the the fugitives that uh, escape when the city is destroyed, uh, he describes them as mourning doves. Now, it's interesting how the, a dove is connected uh, in Scripture with mourning, maybe because they make a kind of a mournful sound there. I don't know what you describe it there. Cooing or whatever is a mournful sound. And we just we, we have Scripture to support that. Uh, for instance, in Isaiah 38, verse 14, it talks about like a crane or a swallow, so did I chatter, I did mourn, as a dove, mine eyes fail with looking upward, O Lord, I am oppressed, undertake for me. So again, mine eyes uh, fail. It says, I did mourn like a dove. So again, one of mourning. Again, in Isaiah uh, 59, just simply comparing Scripture with Scripture, seeing consistently the dove is a picture of mourning. And so it says uh, in uh, 59 verse 11, it says, We roar all like bears and mourn saw like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none for salvation, but it is far from us. So picture is these doves, normally doves are connected with the valleys. And in fact, it, it tells us that, doesn't it? Like doves are the valleys, but they're not in the valleys now. They're in the mountains. And of course, uh, I'm told that when doves are in danger, uh, they fly from the valleys to the mountains. And so there they are in the mountains mourning. And of course, uh, kind of a picture of these that, that managed to escape the destruction of the city. Uh, and they're, they're just scattered on the mountains. They're like mourning doves. And of course, he tells us what they're mourning for. It says again, verse 16, uh, they that escape of them shall escape and shall be on the mountains like doves of the valleys. All of them mourning, everyone for his iniquity. And the thought is that they will at this point realize that God's judgment on Judah is a direct result of their iniquity, and there will be mourning for their iniquity. Uh, they're too weak and frightened to put up any fight uh, against the enemy, uh, back in chapter 6 and verse 9, he had predicted that this would be their condition. He says, They that escape of you shall remember me among the nations, whither they shall be carried captives, because I am broken with their whorish heart, which hath departed from me, and with their eyes, which go whoring after their idols. They shall load themselves for their evils, which they have committed in all their abominations. So there they are, they're, they're mourning, uh, they're weak, they're frightened. All they can do is throw themselves on the mercy of the Lord in their condition. And that's where they find themselves. Uh, they're in a very sorrowful state. And of course, uh, we know the way of the transgressor is hard. And they're experiencing that, the hardship uh, as a result of God's judgment upon them. So from verse, uh, basically, uh, 18 onwards, uh, well, 17 through 19, we're going to think about the impotence of wealth, uh, the powerlessness of wealth. Uh, wealth, when wealth has no worth whatsoever. And so it, it begins this way, all hands shall be feeble and all knees shall be weak as water. Uh, it's kind of interesting that uh, we'll, in, in common English usage, we often use the phrase, I'm as weak as water. It's kind of it's one of those phrases that's found its way into the English language. Actually, there's a there's a very interesting article uh, on webtruth.org, a very fascinating website, webtruth.org, by Michael Penfold, and he talks about all the 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 common phrases that have come into the English language that came as a direct result of the King James Bible. This is just one of them, but there are many, and it's very interesting to see how the King James Bible has really influenced the speech of uh, the not just the nation, not just the but but wherever this Bible has gone, it's affected the, the speech, and these phrases have come in. And so here's one, weak as water. It's used again, by the way, in Ezekiel 21. And verse 7, 
where again that phrase is taken up and he says and it shall be when they say unto thee wherefore sighest thou that thou shalt answer for the tidings because it cometh and every heart shall melt and all hands shall be feeble and every spirit shall faint and all knees shall be weak as water behold it cometh and shall be brought to pass saith the lord god knees shall be as weak as water and i suppose the idea is that water tends not to hold together and so your kind of knees feel like they're going to buckle they're not being held together you just you feel just as as the saying goes as weak as water so this is the going to be the condition that they're going to be in and then it says in verse 18 they shall also gird themselves with sackcloth horror shall cover them and shame shall be upon all faces and baldness upon their heads. So these are usually signs of repentance, aren't they? Sackcloth, uh, they, they um, covered with sackcloth, uh, gird, girded with sackcloth, uh, shame on their faces. And, 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 and so they're, they're usually things associated with repentance and with mourning for sin. And um, of course, Nineveh, uh, they repented in sackcloth and ashes, and God actually held back judgment, didn't he, from Nineveh because of their, much to jo Jonah's uh, dissatisfaction. Uh, he knew that that's what God would do. But it's interesting that when Judah get to that place, God is not going to hold back the judgment. He's not going to, and part of the reason is, and I think it's an interesting reason, is the Ninevites they heard one message from a very reluctant prophet and they repented at the preaching of Jonah. What about Judah? How many messages did they hear? Jeremiah keeps telling us that he sent his prophets rising up early and speaking to them. They had heard message after message over four centuries and never repented. And it's now, it's like the Lord is saying, too little, too late. In fact, we might even suggest that even part of their repentance shows they're, they're so gripped by pagan ideas uh, that it even colors their repentance. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, notice it says, again, the end of verse 18 says, they shall also gird themselves with sackcloth, horror shall cover them, shame shall be upon all faces, and baldness upon all their heads. Baldness shall be upon all their heads. Usually uh, connected with a sign of mourning. And if you look at uh, the prophet Micah, uh, we're going to look at a couple of references to this baldness idea, shaving their heads. Of course, Ezekiel, remember, had to shave his head and we, we saw that his his strange haircut but in micah 1 16 it says make thee bald and pull thee for thy delicate children enlarge thy baldness as the eagle for they are gone into captivity from thee so again at least in micah it's connected with jerusalem going into captivity it's considered to be uh, again something that is a sign of mourning However, when we go back to the book of Deuteronomy, we'll actually see that uh, this idea of shaving the head as a sign of mourning was more frequently a practice that was connected with the pagan world and not with the people of God. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 1, it says, You are the children of the Lord your God. You shall not cut yourselves, nor make any baldness between your eyes, for the dead so the thought was that they weren't supposed to do that it was more of a, a pagan thing that they shaved their heads in mourning and so it's just a thought i'm not being dogmatic about it but it almost seems that even in their repentance it shows how gripped they were by pagan practices so they they have this semblance of 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 genuine repentance but actually really all semblance of godliness was gone they were really kind of thoroughly paganized in every way what they're learning for sure is that god is not mocked 
they had been mocking God and uh, he's not mocked now. They're finding to their uh, great uh, distress uh, that God is uh, giving them uh, what they have basically sowed, they're reaping. And so he says unto them in verse 19, they shall cast their silver in the streets and their gold shall be removed. Their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They shall not satisfy their souls, neither fill their bowels, because it is the stumbling block of their iniquity. Two thoughts are suggested here. First of all, concerning the rich, perhaps have accumulated wealth. Uh, we're going to see later on there's been a lot of injustice that has been done in Judah, maybe by unjust means. And this wealth, which often people try to use, as it were, to uh, build a protection around themselves, but in this particular time of the Babylonian captivity or the Babylonian invasion, this wealth is going to do them no good whatsoever. And, of course, we see that in a time of crisis, uh, wealth is worthless. Uh, I remember uh, seeing movies about the Holocaust and Jews even sowing uh, you know, money into their coats as they were going off to the camps. And of course, everything was removed from them. It was all taken away. And all that money was in different, they even had it in different currencies. It was just taken by their captives. It was of no value. All the wealth that they had kind of built up against the day of wrath, uh, it did them no good whatsoever. And of course, that's when we realize uh, that these things are not really valuable. I remember years ago seeing a, a thing about Shanghai when the Japanese invaded. And of course, the the expats that were living in Shanghai, a lot of them lived very wealthily. And there's a, this amazing picture of a football field filled with all the limousines, all the, the silver, the gold, all the kind of fancy uh, antiques and everything was all just piled up on a football field. And they were all taken off to... Uh, internment camps. And what did it do for them in the day of wrath? Absolutely nothing. What we could say is this, uh, and there's a good practical lesson here, that first of all, money cannot buy salvation, <laughs> right? Uh, you, you can't earn your way to heaven. Uh, Catholic Church tried that one time, you know, get, you get, if you, if you, you know, kind of buy indulgences, you'll be, you'll be kind of free from purgatory and, 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 uh, be able to go to heaven. You cannot buy salvation. It's a free gift given to us, eternal life through Jesus Christ. Secondly, finances, although uh, we want to be good stewards and all the rest of it, and there's a lot, the Bible has a lot to say about stewardship, but in the day of wrath, it finances are not going to help. <laughs> it's of no value. And that's what we see here. You can't eat money, gold or jewelry, uh, the things that were valuable when you're in the siege of Jerusalem, uh, people would give great wealth just for a piece of bread. <laughs> That's what they really wanted, something to satisfy them. And so all this wealth uh, would be of no value. They, in fact, they, they, the streets will be littered with it. They're going to throw their silver away because uh, they realize it's no value. Uh, and of course, um, we, the Babylonian army uh, would take the loot along with their expensive idols. And this is the other thought here, is not only uh, is this uh, just talking about the, the idolatry of accumulated wealth, which is not going to do them any good in this particular day, and it won't do anybody any good in the day of judgment. And again, we, we have to remind ourselves of that. Uh, some of the wealthy elites that, that feel like they can tell us how to live and what to do, but in a, a coming day, all their wealth will do them no good whatsoever when they stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it'll, it'll be of no value to them. Uh, and so, uh, of course, we know the story, the rich man and Lazarus. What, what did the rich man's riches do for him in Hades? Nothing. And so that's a, the riches of no value in that sense. But also notice again in verse 19, uh, he says at the end of verse 19, he says, speaking of all this silver and gold, it says, um, they shall not satisfy their souls, neither shall fill their bowels, because it is the stumbling block of their iniquity. Now, this phrase, stumbling block of their iniquity, I want to just focus on this because it would maybe give us a clue that a lot of their wealth 
had been put into their idols. Uh, you know, they would use silver and gold to decorate these idols, often made of wood or something like that, and then they would be covered over or overlaid with gold and silver and they, uh, become a stumbling block of their iniquity. Uh, how do we know that? Look at, forward, please, to Ezekiel chapter 14. And we want to uh, notice um, verse 3. Well, let's read from verse 2. It says, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? Therefore speak unto them, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart, and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to the prophet, I the Lord will answer him, that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. And so what we can see here is that this stumbling block of iniquity is directly connected with idolatry, idols in their heart. Now, we realize that, of course, money and wealth can be an idol that we set up in our hearts. Uh, the desire of becoming rich can become a real snare to people. But not only that, uh, these people were using their wealth, attributing their success to these idols. They were setting them up, decorating them, and they had become a stumbling block of iniquity in their hearts. And again, in this day of judgment, what are they going to do? They're going to throw the idols in the streets as well, because they're going to be shown to have been absolutely powerless to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. No value whatsoever. Let's just... Uh, emphasize this idea that wealth itself can become, uh, in one sense, a uh, an idol in our hearts if we're not careful. Again, it's, there's, a, there's a lovely balance between being good stewards of the manifold grace of God and what he has blessed us with, and, and, and we want to recognize that without it becoming a snare and an idol. And so the Lord says in Matthew 6, 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. So the getting of wealth uh, had been often, we'll, we'll see as we move on in this chapter, through exploitation of the poor, uh, through injustice, uh, all of this, it was anathema to God, and it would not avail them at all. Their idols uh, would not do them any good. Their wealth would not do them any good. In fact, in their haste to escape the uh, evading army, uh, we're, we're going to see here, they cast them out on the streets, lest they be hampered and encumbered by them. And it is interesting. I remember one time we had a, a chimney fire, and uh, it looked like it was going to burn the house. And uh, we were outside. And I got my wife and the children were out. And I said to Emery, is there anything in there you want me to go back and get? And she said, no, I have everything I need here. And everything else, let it burn, thankfully. And the fire department came and they were able to put the fire out and we didn't lose anything. But it's interesting when you face with those questions, what is really valuable? <laughs> What is really important is the people we love and it's our relationship with the Lord that are the most important things. And so we see here the, the wealth was of no help to them whatsoever in this day of wrath. Now verse uh, 20 through 22, we want to think about the impurity of the temple. We've kind of finished our five word pictures. Now he wants to talk about the real reason that this judgment is coming. Now, he's going to elaborate on this in chapters 8 through 11, but he's, he's kind of setting the stage for what is to come. The very place that God had meant to be beautified, they had actually polluted. They were, they were beautifying their idols, and they were even, as we'll see in Ezekiel 8 through 11, putting them in the very temple of God, in the very house of God. And so um, they, 
sadly, the very place that was meant to be beautified, they'd polluted with the multitude of abominations, which which we'll see described in detail. So verse 20, we'll just, just read it. It says, um, as for the beauty of his ornament, and I believe that his here should be capitalized. It's speaking of the Lord. He set it in majesty, but they, as opposed to he. So you see the distinction here that God's set up this temple meant to be a very majestic, beautiful place, uh, fitting for the God of all the earth, fitting for uh, the God of Israel. And so he said, he said it in majesty, but they made the images of their abominations and of their detestable things therein. Therefore have I set it far from them. And I will give it into the hands of the strangers for a prey and to the wicked of the earth for a spoil and they shall pollute it. So the thought here is this, that the very sanctuary of God, the very temple itself was going to be defiled and destroyed. Now it was already defiled and destroyed by their abominations, but the heathen were going to completely defile and destroy the temple. Now, the Jews had kind of almost depended upon the temple as a good look charm to save them. In their minds, God would not allow this beautiful temple to be overrun by pagan soldiers. Just like in the days of Eli, when the ark was sent into battle as if like this is our this is our guarantee they're not going to defeat us we've got the very symbol of the divine presence with us well the symbol of the divine presence here is the temple and they felt as long as they had that they were safe they were secure the pagans would never defeat them they obviously had not learned the lesson of history they had not learned the lesson concerning eli and the ark taken into battle and now they're looking at the temple and they say, well, where do you get that from? Are you just making this up? Look at Jeremiah 7. I just want you to see Jeremiah chapter 7 to see that this is exactly what they were looking at. The house of God uh, was considered to be their immunity from uh, destruction by the pagans. And so he says in uh, Jeremiah 7 verse 4, trust ye not in lying words saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord the temple of the Lord are these. And so basically they were they were saying, we're, we're safe. You know, we have the temple of the Lord. No, no pagan's going to take Jerusalem while ever the temple of the Lord is there. And so uh, this is their conviction. And yet God says, no, uh, the wicked of the earth will come. They will pollute it. Verse 22, here's the reason. He says, my face will I also turn from them and they shall pollute my secret place, even the very holiest of all. They shall pollute my secret place, for the robbers shall enter into it and defile it. And so God is saying the house of God is going to fall. And of course, we know historically that they burned the temple. <laughs> it was destroyed. That's why uh, after the captivity, they have to rebuild the temple, don't they? They have to rebuild the walls of the city. Uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, those books deal with it. Uh, with it, Prophets like Hosea talk about rebuilding the house of, of God. Sorry, Haggai speak about rebuilding the house of God. So verse 23, we want to think in the final little section here in chapter 7, 23 through 27, much of their uh, present condition was due to the ineffectiveness of leadership. So we've seen the impurity of the temple in verse 20 through 22, spoiled by their abominations. Now the ineffective of effectiveness of leadership. There's no help for them in the prophet and the priest at this time. So notice he says, make a chain. For the land is full of bloody crimes and the city is full of violence. So Ezekiel is, is commanded to perform another symbolic act by making a chain which was emblematic of the captivity awaiting them. They were going to be taken away in chains into captivity. That's the picture. Make a chain. And of course, uh, we'll, we'll see that this is exactly what was to take place. Let me just look at a couple of scriptures where this idea of make a chain is connected with going into captivity. 
Jeremiah 27, verse 2, Thus saith the Lord to me, Make thee bonds and yokes, and put them upon thy neck. And so they again, like a yoke on their necks, you know, you'll, you get the picture. You've seen pictures of the slave trade in North America where uh, African slaves have been brought and they've got chains and they're in a, in a string around them. Well, that that's uh, exactly the picture that is being brought before us there. Prophet Nahum again has that idea in view. Nahum in chapter 3 and verse 10, it says, Yet was she carried away, she went into captivity, her young children also were dashed in pieces, the top of all the streets, they cast lots for her honorable men, and all her great men were bound in chains. And so he is to make this symbolic chain to show what is coming for the great men, what is coming for those uh, that will be carried away. The chain would be used to tie the captives together to form a long train headed for exile. That's the picture. And of course, there's a reason for this. Uh, it's because of the crimes of blood. Make a chain for the land is full of bloody crimes. Now, the I'm told by uh, other scholars that this idea of crimes of blood uh, these bloody crimes, is to do with judicial murders. Uh, it only occurs here, and it's uh, murderous judicial decisions rather than crimes of violence. So, so the judges had made decisions that resulted in people being uh, killed and, and executed who were, were not guilty. And so it was It was injustice, judicial murders done by those in authority to keep power. Uh, and God is holding them accountable for that, and they'll be carried away in chains. Verse 24, wherefore I will bring the worst of the heathen, and they shall possess their houses. I will also make the pump of the strong to cease, and their holy places shall be defiled. So, the instrument that God is going to use, these Chaldean invaders, the, the Babylonians as we know them, God made no claims that these invaders would be good or righteous. In fact, we're told that they were not good. They were actually the worst of the heathen. So God is using the worst of the heathen to punish his own people, Judah. Now, of course, this has been problematic uh, for God's people. How could you use a worse nation than us as your instrument of judgment upon us? And we're not as bad as them. Of course, this was the issue that perplexed the prophet uh, Habakkuk. And uh, if we if we look at um, uh, Habakkuk, I always get my pronunciation here, chapter 1, verse 13, you can see that this is what's really troubling him. He says, thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? In other words, he's, God is, is, you know, first of all, he's complaining God's not doing anything. And then God says, oh, I am actually going to do something. I'm going to send the, the Chaldeans, a hasty nation, to judge you. And now Habakkuk is saying, oh, hold on a minute, Lord. I, I, I'm i glad you're doing something, but how could you do that? How could you possibly use a nation that is more wicked than us to judge us? And it would be like if the Lord allowed, for instance, China or Russia, to invade North America because of our sins as uh, collectively as a nation. And we might be tempted to say, well, Lord, how could you use them? Like there's no freedoms there. You know, they're, uh, they're much worse than us. And that's how we would think, right? Lord, how, do you, how could you possibly use people like that? But God in his sovereignty can use whoever he chooses to accomplish his purposes. And certainly he is going to use these worst of the heathen to chastise his own people. And part of the reason is his own people have rejected much more light than Babylon ever, ever had. And he's going to use them as his instrument. And so it says, verse 25, destruction cometh and they shall seek peace 
and there shall be none. So there's going to be attempts at brokering peace. Uh, there's going to be various schemes that they're going to come uh, come uh, uh, through the leadership, but they're not going to succeed. He says, mischief shall come upon mischief, and rumor shall be upon rumor. Then shall they seek a vision of the prophet, but the law shall perish from the priest and counsel from the ancients. So when the destroyer comes, the people will look to God to stand for them, to recover their peace, but there'll be none. Uh, and uh, uh, instead, there'll be a piling up of mischief upon mischief, rumor upon rumor. So instead of getting a clear word from God, there'll just be all these rumors going around, but no substance in them and uh, and, and no message from God. The fear uh, engendered by the anticipation of the coming destruction, uh, when that is in itself a source of terror, uh, it will it will there'll be lots of reports of the invaders cruelty and all this kind of stuff it'll be allowed to multiply people will be kind of terrorized by fear of this coming invasion and they'll look to the prophet but it says uh, they would see no vision again the leadership will fail they, they have no message for them they shall a vision for the prophet uh, also the law shall uh, fall from the priest uh, remember that they were meant to be teaching priests that were meant to uh, teach them the ways of righteousness. Uh, if you look at Second Chronicles chapter 15 and verse 3, uh, we read this. It says, Now for a long season Israel hath been without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. <laughs> and so, uh, again, the, the priesthood would fail, the prophets would fail. They'd failed a long time. Uh, they had not taught the people the right way. Uh, many false prophets tell them they're doing okay, everything's fine. So there was no help whatsoever uh, from the prophet or the priest. But then, verse 27, there's no help from the political establishment as well. It says, the king shall mourn, the prince shall be clothed with desolation, the hands of the people of the land shall be troubled. I will do unto them after their ways, and according to their deserts will I judge them. They shall know that I am the Lord. So now we think of the political establishment. And at that time in their history, um, the King Jehoiakim and the Prince Zedekiah, the leadership were in utter chaos. These men refused to listen to Jeremiah's message. What Jeremiah told them is, is just kind of make peace with the Babylonians and, and, and the city will be spared, but they wouldn't listen. And so as a result of failure, in fact, they their thought was, uh, if we make an alliance with Egypt, uh, maybe that will save us. And so the political establishment failed as well. And so inevitability is that judgment would come. And as a result of the judgment, they would know that he is the Lord. So we see the ineffectiveness of leadership, both in the religious sense, the prophet and the priest, in the sense of the political sense, the king and the princes, all failure, judgment has come. Now we move into chapter 8. And what we're going to do is just kind of give a little bit of an overview in the time we have left of this next section. Uh, I think 8 through 11, if you wanted to put a title upon it, you could call it Ichabod, the glory of hath departed from 1 Samuel 4, verse 21. So let's just kind of get our minds adjusted to where we've come. We saw in chapters 1 through 3 a vision of the glory of God. We saw in chapters 4 and 5 Ezekiel acting out sign messages. We've seen in chapter 6 and 7 Ezekiel gives two messages on judgment upon Judah. And now in 8 through 11, he's going to give us the real reason why the glory of God was about to leave the land and why the city was going to be destroyed, including the temple. So we're really getting down to the nitty gritty. Here's here. If you want, this is for this cause. This is the reason eight through 11 is going to give us the reason. Of course, it comes as we've already uh, established in a section where the prophet had eaten this scroll and written therein was lamentations, mourning, 
and woe. That's in chapter 2, verse 10. And so uh, Ezekiel has eaten this scroll about mourning, lamentation, and woe, uh, and now he's going to deal with the divine reasons for the judgment. Of course, we recognize, don't we, uh, a biblical principle, First Peter 4, 17, judgment must begin first at the house of God. And so we're going to be looking at judgment at the house of God. And that's kind of the plan of Ezekiel. In chapters 4 through 24, you have judgment on the nation. In chapters 25 through 33, you have judgment on the nations. So he deals with the nation first. The people that had the most light get judged first. And then the nations who had less light, they get judged secondly. So the section before us uh, gets to the very heart of the problem and the necessity of divine judgment. A defiled house which Jehovah could no longer dwell in. One of the things we learn about God and his glory, Isaiah 42, verse 8, let me just read it. We're, we're very familiar with it, but it's a really important principle. And that is this, that God will not share his glory with anyone. Isaiah 42, 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. So here's the difficulty. We're going to see in 8 through 11, Ezekiel is going to get a, a view of what was actually going on in the sanctuary, in the house of God. And he's going to see why God's glory could no longer stay there because they had expected him to share his glory with all these images and uh, these these idols. And God will not share his glory with anyone. And so his glory is about to leave the house of God. Now you say, well, does this have any relevance whatsoever to, to us? Well, it does, because one of, one of the seven churches in the book of Revelation, the one that we're familiar with called Laodicea, where the Lord Jesus who is the Lord of glory, is found to be outside the house. He's knocking on the door. He's calling on the individual for fellowship with him, but he himself could no longer stay there. He wasn't comfortable there. There was stuff going on in that house that caused him to be outside the door. And so, of course, we know it very well, Revelation 3, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, if anyone hears my voice. And so that's the picture here. And so we see the very same thing about to happen. God is about to leave, his glory is about to leave the temple and move to the east gate from there to move to the mountain towards the east and then leave and abandon the city to its destruction. Now, although 8 through 11 is a complete section, which is what we're going to be entering into. It divides into four distinct parts, and in this case, the chapter divisions are really well done. So, for instance, in chapter 8, it's the wickedness in the house of God. We're going to look at the degrading idolatry that they had brought into the house of God. In chapter 9, we're going to look at the slaughter of the people of God. And it's a discriminatory judgment, uh, discrimin forget this right, discriminatory judgment. And that is this, that we're going to see when we get to chapter 9, that there are going to be a mark put on those that sigh and cry for the abominations. So the, the Lord knows those that are his, <laughs> and he's going to set a mark on them, and they're not going to be slaughtered, but the ones that do not have a mark are going to be slaughtered. So that's going to be the picture. It's a, it's a judgment that is very selective. There are going to be some that are marked out and be saved. The rest are going to be judged. So slaughter the people of God, chapter 9. Chapter 10, the departure of the glory of God, and then the destruction of the city from God. We're going to see that in chapter 10. And then chapter 11, we're going to see judgment on the leaders of God. And we're going to see a depopulation and a scattering. So that's kind of the, the the way forward that we're going to be going. These visions given to Ezekiel in 8 through 11 are followed by verbal messages given to Ezekiel in 12 through 19. So just like before, 
We had him acting out these things and then verbal messages. Now he's going to be given this vision of the way things are in the house of God uh, and in the city of Jerusalem in 8 through, through 11. And then 12 through 19, we're going to have verbal messages given. Now, by the way, this is very interesting. If you look at chapter 12, I want you to notice something that in 12 through 19, these messages, each new message that Ezekiel gives are easily marked out by this phrase, the word of the Lord came unto me. So if you want to just look here, this is if this is an underliner's dream, if you like underlining things. Chapter 12, verse 1, the word of the Lord also came unto me, saying, chapter 12, verse 8, and in the morning came the word of the Lord unto me, saying, that's message number two, verse 17 of chapter 12, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, chapter 21, of chapter 12 and the word of the lord came unto me saying chapter 26 uh, or verse 26 sorry of chapter 12 again the word of the lord came unto me saying 13 1 the word of the lord came unto me saying and then we move on to 16 chapter 16 verse 1 again the word of the lord came unto me saying we move on again to 17 the word of the lord came unto me saying that's 17 verse 1 17 verse 11 moreover the word of the lord came unto me saying 18 verse 1, the word of the Lord came unto me again, saying. So he's giving direct messages from God uh, as a result of the vision that is given in verses uh, chapters 8 through 11. Now, it seems that the messages that he gives were short intervals in between each message, allowing time for it to give its impression. So he gives a message, interval, gives a message, interval, gives a message, and he's really communicating to them, leaving a deep impression on them. So these visions in verse 8 through 11 are really expanding on the statement in verse chapter 7, verse 20. As for the beauty of his ornament, he set it in majesty, but they made the images of their abominations and of their detestable things therein. Therefore, have I set it far from them. So he's kind of expounding on this. The house of God that was meant to be a place of majesty and great glory. was made. It was, Solomon made it exceeding magnifical, the King James says. It was a house uh, of glory for the Lord. And they had put their images in it. And that's why his glory has to go far away. So the reason that he gives this vision is so that the exiles can understand the reason and therefore the certainty of impending judgment upon Jerusalem. He's going to be shown these visions and then he's going to give them to those that are around him, ask, you know, kind of coming to him, listening for a message from him. He's going to give a message to those in, in captivity, explaining why Jerusalem has to fail and has to fall. So let's look at chapter 8, verse 1. And we'll notice this. It came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house, the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. So this is the, the second kind of uh, section of Ezekiel, because if you look at chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2, we get the, the date of his first messages. And so it says, It came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, fifth day of the month, that I was among the captives by the river of Kibar, the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God in the fifth day of the month, which is the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. So he's he's in the uh, fourth month, fifth day of the month, in the fifth year of Jehoiakim's captivity. When we look here in chapter 8, came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house, the, the Lord the hand of the Lord fell upon him. So really 14 months have elapsed since the first series of visions. So there's a pause, 14 month gap. Everything's dated from the year of Joachim's captivity. 
Now, if we use lunar months, which is what they used in the ancient world, it's around 420 days on since the first vision. Now, if we allow a little time for the commencement of the action sermons, Ezekiel, remember he was laying on his left side and then his right side. So Ezekiel now, as he makes these, is given these visions in chapter 8, he's in the 40 days lying on his right side, bearing the iniquity of the house of Judah. So it's very fitting that in that time frame where he's on his right side and he is giving this message to the house of the iniquity of the house of Judah, that he should be transported to the temple and given a first-hand view of the iniquity of the house of Judah. And he will be shown God's clear justice in bringing his actions against Judah and Jerusalem. Now, we notice that the elders had come to visit him at his house. And so the elders of Judah sat before me. The hand of the Lord was there upon me. So these elders have come. They sat before him. Now, again, why are they doing that? What are they looking for? Well, they're expecting to get a word from the Lord. Uh, we know that because we see it in other places. Chapter 14, verse 1. It says, then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying. Uh, we see it again in uh, Ezekiel 20. The elders coming before him, expecting to hear some message from God. It says it came to pass in the seventh year, in the fifth month, the tenth day of the month, that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me so the elders have come and they're sat before him and they're expecting that he might have a message for them from the lord by the way it's a good principle isn't it to uh, to have an expectancy uh, that as god's word is being spoken that we might get a message from the lord uh, when we uh, i hope we have that expectancy when we go to the meetings uh, uh, this coming week, I'll be at a conference and there'll be another speaker. And I'm praying that God would have a message for my heart from the other speaker. Uh, I know what I'm going to say, but it'd be nice to hear something from the Lord. And so that sense of expectancy. And so that's what they were seeking. And of course, they were inquiring. Uh, and, and I would suggest to you that one of the things that they were were hoping was that they would be able to return to Judah and Jerusalem soon. That's the message they really wanted. Part of it could be that Jeremiah had written to those in captivity and he'd given them a different message, one that they were to settle down. Uh, notice Jeremiah 29 verse 1. Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders which were carried away captive to the priest, to the people, and all the people from Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. And what was the message? Uh, verse 4, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build ye houses, dwell in them, plant gardens, eat the fruit of them. Uh, verse 7, Seek the peace of the city. And then verse 10, for thus saith the Lord, after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I'll visit you and perform my good words toward you in causing you to return to this place. So no doubt as a result of receiving this letter from Jeremiah, they wondered, is, is, is Ezekiel going to say the same thing or does he have a different message for us? Does he have a message that we're going to go back? And so he's going to give him a message. And the message is there's nothing to go back to. God is going to flatten Jerusalem. He's going to judge it. The temple is going to be destroyed and all the rest of it. So the hand of the Lord comes upon him. Fourth time we've seen this, uh, strengthening him to give this message. He's going to need strengthening. Remember, he's been on this, uh, this, this restricted diet uh, for 420 days of just eating this weighed out bread and this water. So he's going to need the hand of the Lord to fall upon him. He's probably feeling quite weak uh, as he has acted out uh, some of the things that are going to take place uh, in the, uh, the siege of Jerusalem. And so 
we mentioned before, six times it's going to say the hand of the Lord came upon him uh, in this book. So he's going to give a message. Notice he says, by the way, something different here. He says, the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. Adonai Jehovah. Now, why does he use that title? The hand of the Lord God has come upon me. Well, the first time we see those phrases put together, uh, the Lord God goes back to Genesis chapter 15. And I want to just read it. And with this, we'll conclude our study this morning. But Genesis 15 in verse 8, where it says, he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Lord had just promised him that he was going to give him a land. And he and he 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 calls God Adonai Jehovah, the Lord God. Where will I know? And so the same Lord God who promised this land to Abraham and his descendants is now about to abandon the land and the people are going to be scattered from it. And so that's why he connects the phrase Lord God uh, with that which has gone before to show that it's connected with this inheritance. They're going to be kicked out of their inheritance. Well, our time is gone and we're going to be kicked off our session. And uh, may the Lord encourage us uh, to be faithful in days, uh, especially in the house of God, that uh, we might be not like the Laodiceans.